Hey there, I'm Andy Langer from Austin City Limits Radio and from Texas Monthly. And what you're watching, this keynote, it marks the first time Willie Nelson has appeared as a speaker at South by Southwest. Back in 1992, he was scheduled to deliver the keynote and the bus simply didn't make it back in time for that 10.30 a.m. speech from a concert he was playing elsewhere. I'm not sure who books Willie for a 10.30 a.m. speech, but apparently the South by Southwest folks did. So to make up missing that show, uh, that keynote, he performed a surprise set later that night at Auditorium Shores. But 30 years later, here we are with that keynote. I'm gonna spare you for the most part an introduction, but I am gonna tell you what Willie's been up to lately. There's the new album, That's Life. That's Willie's second album of standards and classics made famous by Frank Sinatra. In September, me and, Bo me and Sister Bobby, True Tales of the Family Band, the memoir, that was released last September. It details, obviously, the lifelong bond between Willie and his sister Bobby. There's, of course, Willie's Reserve and Willie's Remedy. Those are the cannabis brands that Willie and his wife Annie run. Uh, Willie's Reserve, that's a range of THC cannabis products. And then there's Willie's Remedy. That's the line of hemp-based wellness products. And next up, Willie's Letters to America. This is coming out via Harper Horizon. Turk Pipkin is his co-author. That book is out June 29th. It's a series of letters from the heart. Willie sends and thanks and thoughts to Americans past, present, and future, to his closest family members, to his personal heroes. There's even a letter to COVID-19. So we're gonna get started here. We welcome Willie and not necessarily at South by Southwest, but there's big events, keynotes like this that open with a prayer. I thought we'd open with a joke instead. Uh, 15 years ago, uh, you and I got high. I got high with Snoop Dogg a couple days later. I wrote about it for Esquire. And the thing I remember most about getting high with you 15 years ago was a joke you told me that took my breath away. I ended up uh, coughing a lot at the punchline to this joke. Uh, it's the one about the nuns that are out for a bicycle ride around the Vatican. The punchline? Uh, one of the nuns said, I've never come this way before. The other one said, me neither. It must be the cobblestones. <laughs> We spoke last fall about the pandemic and obviously the death toll is enormous, the suffering uh, and the loss of life is real. But I keep thinking about how hard it must be for you, somebody who's always in motion, somebody who's always moving forward and going to the next thing to have to stay still the way you have for the last year. How tough has that been? Well, it's been really tough on me, but I, I can imagine that it's been tough, not only on me, the performer, but also everybody else who happens to be in the audience, because they come a long way, drive a long way, pay some money to hear somebody get up there and sing, whether it's me or whoever, so they can sing along, clap their hands, and enjoy the music and be a part of it. And I think uh, they're missing it also. Have there been any silver linings from being at home the way you have? Well, things, we, we're lucky, you know. We're very lucky. We're up here with the horses and uh, uh, everything's uh, not only cool, it's cold <laughs> up here, but we're okay. We got plenty to eat. And uh, uh, so we're not like a lot of people out there who are really struggling. So I, we feel very, very fortunate. You've got the studio there. You're able to work at least in the studio. Uh, there's reportedly a family record on the way that's been made during the pandemic. Yeah, me and all uh, the kids uh, got together and the family, sister Bobby and all of us. And uh, it started out being a gospel album and then we added this song and that song and finally decided to call it a family album. And uh, it's, it was really a lot of fun to do. We got Sister Bobby in there to play piano and everything, and she enjoyed it. So uh, I don't know, it'll be out after the Sinatra one, I guess. 
I mean, music and family, those are pandemic proof entities. And they're what you've built your life around. Families? Music and family are both music pandemic family. proof Absolutely. and they're what you've built your life around. Absolutely. And, uh, uh, you know, I miss it a lot. I know the people miss it a lot. The musicians, uh, all the help, everybody who's out of work right now misses it a lot. But I know for sure I do. Typically, back when you could be in front of an audience, what does that feel like when you're you? When you're in front of the microphone, in front of an adoring crowd, what kind of energy, can you explain the energy exchange? Can you explain what you get out of that experience? Well, it's a very positive exchange to start with. I mean, I'm glad to be there and I think they're glad to be there. And we're all enjoying doing what we, they enjoy listening to music. We enjoy playing it. And it's, uh, you know, it's a win-win situation for all of us. Was there ever stage fright for you? Excuse me, stage fright? Was there ever a stage where you were a, a guy who worried about stage fright? I know you don't have it now. But back in the day, one of the first, my, my very first performance, I was about five years old. And my grandmother had dressed me up in a little white sailor suit, short, with the red trims. And I had a poem that I was going to recite. But before I could do it, I started picking my nose. My nose started bleeding. I was bleeding all over my white sailor suit. Then I started my my speech and it was uh what are you looking at me for i ain't got nothing to say if you don't like the looks of me you can look the other way so that was my first performance <laughs> one of the things that you do almost every night is right at the end of the show you go to the lip of the stage and you shake hands and sign autographs and spend some personal time with as many folks that can rush towards the front of the stage as possible. Uh, it's, it's a really great moment every night. Did you learn that from someone else or is that something, where, where did that come about? Well, first of all, I'm, I'm glad they're there. Uh, I love them all for being there. And I like to go out and shake hands and hug every one of them every night if I could. So, no, this is a big time of the night for me. I really enjoy it. The bus. Do you miss the bus yeah. from this last year? Just the being yeah. on the bus. It's sitting right down there a little ways. And every now and then I go down there and sit in it just to pretend I'm going somewhere. <laughs> you know, I've never asked you, and it may be an apocryphal tale, but typically when you're home there's there's always been this theory that you sleep on the bus even when you're home well when i'm home i i, I probably don't sleep on the bus that much but when i'm out on the road i sleep on the bus all the time i never go inside uh because i've got everything i need on the bus it's a rolling clubhouse it's it's got your bedroom, like you said, you, you don't need a hotel room. What's so comforting about the bus? Billy Jill Shaver said, uh, the closest thing to being free is moving. Moving, and uh, I guess the next best thing is to be on the bus thinking that you might move any minute. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's also part of that, the bus and the moving, it's part of a routine for you. Are, do you have a predictable routine on the road? Well, I try to do exercise every day. Uh, I try to do something to pay for the day. That's you know, the way I look at it. Uh, if you don't use it, you lose it. So there's you know, certain things that I try to do every day, uh, jog a little bit, walk a little bit, whatever. And uh, I think that helps keep me going. I mean, along with exercise, there's a theory that one of your daughters shared with me once where she told me that she believes 
that as people age, particularly when they get to your age, people start talking to older folks differently, that they consider them a burden in a lot of cases, and it's a drag to be old. But with you, there's the adulation of fans. There's people are always happy to see you. Nobody disrespects you the way the elderly are sometimes disrespected. And she told me that she thinks that's what keeps you young. Does that sound right? It has a lot to do with it, absolutely. I mean, you, that energy exchange you think is keeping you young. That energy exchange helps keep me going, really. Your sister in the book, Me and Sister Bobby, says for Willie, the road is endless. He's been wandering off since he was a little boy. Wandering off is just his nature. It feeds his restless spirit. Early on, where were you wandering off to? As a oh, kid. As a kid, it's, uh, I'd wander, you know, I'd wander off down toward the barn or out to the cornfield. The next thing I'm over by the railroad track and the next thing I'm catching a freight train going to Hillsboro. So, uh, you know, it's kind of through the years, it moved along and uh, uh, I really enjoyed catching a freight train and riding to Hillsboro or, or Waco. Uh, it, I don't know, that was my hobby, I guess. From that book and particularly from Bobby's telling of your story, it seems to me that one of your gifts is that real early on, you had a real sense of self, that you were fearless and you didn't suffer fools and you didn't have an easy childhood though. I imagine that made you both strong and grateful from early on. Well, yeah, a lot of things I think helped me along. First of all, I come from a place where there's a lot of great people. Abbott, Texas, you know, uh, it's down there at Hill County next to Waco, Hillsboro, Itasca, all them great towns that uh, I grew up with all those kids around there playing all kind of games, uh, basketball, football, baseball. We ran track, pole vaulting, all that good stuff. And so I feel like I still have a lot of friends up in there. And those friends were early role models? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I uh, have, you know, nobody would know them but me, but I have some role models out there that taught me ways to go whenever I needed some help. Chris Christopherson once said that you wear the world like a loose garment. <laughs> but also clear from Bobby's telling of your story is that you also had a temper may have a temper and not a lot of patience. And we think of you as this sort of Yoda-like part Dalai Lama figure. Wrong. <laughs> How do you keep that temper in check? I smoke a lot of pot. <laughs> really? <laughs> keeps me from killing people, you know. <laughs> or keeps me from getting killed. <laughs> But uh, think positive, that helps. Is there, is there ego? Um, I was looking at Dan Rather's book recently and he was talking about always, you know, as a network news anchor, having to ride the line between confidence and conceit. Does the, the answer may just be the marijuana, but what keeps the ego in check? There's no way. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing works. <laughs> the, I mean, there's ego, and then there's being an asshole. And the the family I, motto I, is I, "Don't I be got an asshole." Covered. Got you covered on all fronts. Sir. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, is not being an asshole harder than it looks? I've never tried. <laughs> I. <laughs> It must be because a lot of people are able to control and some people can't, uh, most people can't. Uh, I've never tried that much. But you also, 
I mean, in all fairness, I mean, you're you're a guy who lives gracefully and largely lives without judgment, or at least that's the way we see you. Is there a key to that, to living that way? Forgive, forget, and move on. Uh, that's the way I live. Let's talk about the farm and marijuana. I mean, Willie's Reserve is built around four principles, personal freedom, the medical efficacy, social justice, sustainability. How important early on was it that the brand, if you're gonna get into the marijuana business, did it represent your ideals? Well, I had some help there. Uh, my wife, Annie, is very sharp in that respect. There's some gals up in Colorado uh, that are also very good uh, at business. Uh, I call them my highwaymen, my highwaymen. And uh, Liz and all the gals up in Oklahoma, have done a, uh, no, Colorado, have done a great job. And they have also a lot of help, too. So, uh, uh, you know, I've been lucky to have good people. Legalization and decriminalization. Have we come further than you expected us to, or are we still lagging behind on those efforts? No, I think uh, we have made a lot of progress through the through the years since uh, the first time I was busted for marijuana. Uh, <laughs> we've made a lot of progress. We've come a long way. Uh, there's a lot of people who have joined, jumped on the bandwagon and realized that uh, marijuana is uh, medicinal. It can help you in a lot of ways. Uh, and the more they think about it and the more they realize that's true, then the more uh, people in more states will legalize it. And I think it's come across pretty good. A lot of states out there are, uh, have already legalized it medicinally and also uh, recreationally, but more, st more states are on the way. Farmers, what, ha what needs to happen for them right now, especially coming out of the pandemic? Well, they're, they're in a terrible situation again. They always were on the bottom rung of the economy because first of all, without the farmer, we don't eat. So they're very important and they haven't been treated as important uh, and they should be. And that's you know part of what we do at Farm Aid is to draw attention to the fact that the small family farmer keeps us going. It keeps the country going. So we have to keep him going. In 35 years of Farm Aid later, what do you think's changed the most? I mean, because they, they're still in a position where they need help. Well, yeah, the, there is more attention being called to it. Uh, more people are looking at it and realizing that, wait a minute, we got to take care of the small family farmer, period. We got to quit buying our groceries and our breakfast from 1500 miles away when there's a farmer right over there that can grow it for you every day and bring it to the farm to market. Find you a farmer, find you a place to uh, get people to grow food for you and you'll be smarter. Abbott was and is such a small town, yet you grew up as a progressive. How'd that happen? Well, who were the role models, especially, I mean, you grew up around the church. What steered you away from prejudice and towards progress? Oh, I went through all of that. Uh, I grew up working in the cotton fields, first of all, and it was me and uh, some Mexicans and some black folks and uh, a lot of people out there picking cotton, pulling a hundred pounds of cotton in our sack. I never did pull that much myself. <laughs> I had a smaller sack, but it's hard work. Uh, I wouldn't take a, a nickel or a hundred dollars or a million dollars for the work that I did in the farms, in the farm fields, but I realized how hard it is. And I don't want to go back to that, but I think we should help the ones who are still out there trying to make us and grow us good, healthy food. I mean, there are people when they hear you talking about marijuana reform, 
and about farmers and, you know, even about Beto. There are people that are always surprised that you have opinion X, Y, or Z. And you address that in Letters to America. Uh, you say I'm amused sometimes when someone's surprised that I have opinions about issues that I feel are important to America. I think I've been pretty clear all along on who I am and what I believe in. Uh, but you also say that while you've never been afraid to speak up, you're also not interested in losing half your audience and that music should be bringing people together. I believe that, absolutely. That's, uh, that's why in our shows, you don't hear any political speeches at all. Uh, I hope everybody out there is independent as, as I am, you know, and if, <laughs> if they, whatever they want to be, that's cool with me. As long as they like on the road again, we can be happy. I mean, on the one hand, we're this divided nation, but, and in that sense, showing what you believe in is important. I mean, how do you walk that line in such a divided nation as we are right now? Well, I think you have to ask yourself, what do I feel? What do I really believe? And live that way, you know? Uh, it, it's, it's really not hard. I just wrote a song. In fact, I just got a new record. It hadn't come out yet, but it's called Energy Follows Thought. So be careful what you ask for because energy follows thought. Kindness to others is the only rent we pay for our room on earth. That's something Muhammad Ali inscribed to you on a photo. It sits over in Luck, Texas. Absolutely. I know you've looked at it a million times. Absolutely. Every time I'm in your headquarters there, I look at that photo and I'm amazed at sort of the, I'm not amazed at the wisdom of Muhammad Ali, but I, I look at that wisdom What's that mean to you? Well, Muhammad Ali was a, a great man, uh, a great human being, and I fought literally for what he believed in. And uh, I loved him. Uh, we got to be great friends. Uh, he gave me a punching bag one <laughs> and come in and hit it a few licks on the bus to show me how it really ought to be done. So no, Muhammad Ali and I were great buddies. Your children, are all activists. They all work around causes they believe in. How important was instilling that sense in them, a sense that they could make a difference? Well, I think it's very important that, uh, that people have something that they believe in, something that they can live for, uh, argue about, uh, fight for, you know. Uh, it's important to have those valuable things to uh, keep you going. And I'm proud of my boys, proud of the girls, the whole family, everybody, everybody in the family are fighters, uh, and tough as nails, and they've come up the hard way, really, in a lot of ways, but they've become good human beings, and uh, I'm proud of every one of them. How much of the emphasis you put on family over the years is because you were raised by your grandparents? Um, did that importance, that focus on family come from having to sort of piece yours together as a kid? I think I learned the value of family, seeing it busted up and going both, every different way. Uh, I, I saw how horrible that was to everybody involved, including the children trying to grow up. So yeah, I think uh, I learned a lot about how to live with uh, family because it's important. What's the best thing you did as a father to help raise successful independent children? Well, I always tried to remember some advice that uh, uh, an ex father-in-law of mine uh, said one time, somebody asked him about what to do, what, what is your advice? He said, Take my advice and do what you want to. So I, th I think that's good. <laughs> uh, one of the 
things that I, you've seen your your sister a couple times like you said she's played on this on this new family record for folks that maybe haven't read the book the relationship with your sister with bobby is it safe to say that nobody understands you better than her it's probably yeah that's probably accurate because she knows me better than anybody because she practically raised me you know so uh, uh, yeah, she knows me better than anybody in the world. Your early years were in the church, and we were talking a moment ago about that new song and spirit. Um, you believe in a higher power, but not necessarily organized religion. How much time do you spend pondering how we got here? Here's what I believe, that God is love period. Love is God, period. Uh, you can't have one without the other. And uh, if you live knowing that God is love, in fact, I wrote a song called God is love, and love is God. That's all you need to know. <laughs> How much of your success do you think is by your own hand versus cosmic? It's all cosmic. I'm not responsible for anything I do. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back to those people who instilled a sense of right and wrong in you so early. Were those your grandparents mostly? Well, yeah, they uh, my grandparents raised me and my sister because my parents divorced when I was only six months old, so I didn't know anything else except my grandparents. And uh, they were gospel singers. Uh, they sang at, uh, every, at every week up in uh, the Hillsborough Courthouse. They'd have gospel singing, and we'd all go up there and sing gospel songs. And, uh, I, you know, my granddad was a blacksmith, and I used to help him shoe horses. Uh, in the black in his blacksmith shop so no i had a lot of great raising the early part of the new book there's letters to your grandparents to bobby to the city of abbott there's also one to your running buddy zeke uh tell me about that relationship i mean it was a lifelong relationship and you guys caused a lot of trouble together. We tried, yeah. <laughs> now, Zeke was my best friend. Uh, he taught me a lot about a lot of things, uh, mainly poker, <laughs> dominoes. Uh, we used to trim trees together, the Osclin tree people. Uh, hired people to go around and trim wires off the electric, trim uh, limbs off the wires. And so me and Zeke did that for a while. And we had a lot of fun together. Uh, he was my biggest fan as far as, you know, music was concerned. And we hung out at the Night Owl in West and drank beer and, and uh, raised hell every night. Uh, but Zeke was a funny guy. You know, I remember one night uh, he walked out of the bathroom there at the Night Owl and there was an old drunk sitting there in the chair who just had, had one too many. So he just fell out in the floor. And Zeke went over and said, get up, you son, that's I'll hit you again. Do <laughs> you have any advice for maintaining lifelong friendships? Because you've got so many of those. Oh, I think friends are important. You, they're valuable. They're worth millions and millions of dollars to have one friend. And you treat them like family. That's right. I mean, that's how it became the family Nelson and family. Absolutely. That's not an accident. That's, that's something that you recognized early on. We're all one big family. What was the 22 year old Willie Nelson like? Did he have dreams and ambitions? He probably didn't remember them, but. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he'd have them the night before, but by morning he forgot them, I think. 
is there advice for feeling younger than you are? Well, you're only as old as you feel. I believe that. And uh, Brendan to Norman Lear, you know who he is? Yeah. He's 97 years old, I think. And uh, well, I met him last year, I believe. And I said, Norman, I've been telling everybody it's just a number. Am I right? He said, yeah, it's just a number. <laughs> Not that long ago, your friend Chris Christopherson retired. I mean, you've likely sung on stage with him for the last time. How do you avoid the melancholy that comes with being the last of your breed? I mean, you've lost so many friends over the last couple of years and guys like Chris are retiring. How do you avoid that melancholy? Well, it's like I told Paul Simon when he retired, I said, well, you, you know, you can't make a comeback until you retire. So uh, <laughs> I tell Chris the same thing. You can't make a big comeback till you retire. So I may retire tomorrow, but I'll make a comeback. <laughs> I know you've always gotten a kick out of the meme, the put Willie Nelson in bubble wrap meme. And you've made light over the years of all the premature obituaries and death rumors. But all that stuff just means people love you. I guess that's how you can make fun of it. Well, that's, yeah. And uh, it's really the fact that they think about you is, you know, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned dominoes and poker earlier. Out of dominoes, poker, we're going to throw in chess and golf. Which one of those are you best at? Dominoes. I'm hard to beat at dominoes. Uh, anybody can beat me at chess or golf. <laughs> <laughs> and poker? Uh, poker, I do all right at poker. I mean, dominoes is the one that the least of us know how to do, I think, at this point. Is there a strategic key to winning at dominoes? Uh, yeah, Zeke Varlin was back to Zeke again, you know, he was one of the best domino players that I ever met. And uh, he taught me a lot about the game. And uh, when I was a kid growing up, I played dominoes all the time. There were these old men that would get together and uh, play dominoes. And I'd watch him every day he went to play. And when one of them would have to go somewhere, he'd get me to set in for me, like the partnership dominoes, four people playing. And if I made a mistake, they eat my butt out pretty good about it. So I learned how to play domino. I mean, are those games, golf and dominoes and uh, the poker, is that where we see the flashes of ego and of, I mean, you want to win. You're, you're one of those guys. Well, I think it's important to do things that make you think because it's your brain. If you don't use it, you lose it, period. So challenge it. Dominoes, poker, uh, whatever it takes. Taekwondo, whatever you need to do to challenge yourself, do it. Songwriting would be one of those things. Do you still get the same thrill from putting together words the way you do? Yeah, uh, I'm proud of uh, you know the stuff that I come up with. Uh, when I come up with something. You know. <laughs> I mean, is there an internal checks and balance system around the songwriting where you know whether song X or Y is one that's worth keeping? Have you, you've developed that over the years, I would imagine. I think I have, you know, I think I know, I know what I like and I have to trust what I like as being good uh, and so far it's you know that's the way it's been I uh, I trust my opinion because it comes back to that you know who you are at yeah. this point do you know what you're do you know why can you guess why people 
like you the way they do, why they relate to the music the way they do? Well, I think we all react to the same thing, you know. Uh, music will move you, period, you know. Uh, it'll make you laugh or cry or jump or whatever, clap your hands. And anything that will move you, do it. What haven't you done? What's on the bucket list still? Oh, I haven't won all around Cowboy yet. <laughs> you got time to practice, I guess. I've got plenty of time to practice. And plenty of old horses out here to make sure I don't get there. You know. <laughs> I mean, how anxious are you about the other side of this pandemic, of getting past this? I mean, you must think about it all the time. What's it going to feel like to be back on stage, you think? Well, I don't know. Really, I don't know what it's going to feel like because I don't know what kind of comeback it will be. I don't know who will be able to come to the show. I don't want to do a show anywhere, anytime where there's a danger of somebody getting sick. So that's going to have a lot to do with when I go back to work. But I mean, when you do, and assuming it's safe because you're not going to play something that's not, I imagine that's going to bring a whole new level of excitement to what, to, for you personally. Yeah, it'll be a challenge and it'll be, uh, whenever we do get back and to be moving, it'll be a sign of some sort of success, you know, that we got to run with it. And you're vaccinated now. You shared photos of your vaccinations. Uh, I mean, we're all grateful for, for science, but it's been a real lesson the last year or so, hasn't it? It has. I mean, yeah, we played last March, I guess was our last working day. We played the Houston Fat Stock Show. Rodeo. Uh, rodeo, Fat Stock Show. We had 100,000, uh, 80,000 people. Uh, I miss that, you know. All right, well, we, uh, we all hope we, we all get to be out there uh, relatively soon. So I appreciate this. I know the folks at South by Southwest appreciate this. And, uh, you know, this time it happened almost 30 years after your uh, almost keynote. So thank you again and uh, stay safe and we'll see you soon. Same to you, Andy. It's good talking to you. And uh, tell everybody we said thank you and stay safe. Take care of yourself. Will do. All right. Willie Nelson, ladies and gentlemen.